Daniel, over to you. All right, good morning. Let me just uh, share my screen. I thought my video was pixelated, but it's just my COVID beard. It's looking a little fuzzy. Uh, can you see my slides? All right, uh, let's begin. Uh, so yeah, as Joe uh, suggested, I'm gonna be talking to you about a project we've been doing for the past uh, three or four years, trying to bring research methods into the heart of our undergraduate teaching right from the outset. Uh, this is a project with lots of people uh, listed at the bottom there, I'll, I'll name them at the end. And the idea of our class was to sort of rethink how a first year class uh, could be and center around these two ideas of evidence and inquiry, and um, what's called research embedded teaching. Uh, so most first year introductory class, classes use sort of the textbook model. So each week in an intro to psych thing, you might go through developmental psychology, then perception, then cognition, and you separate it by discipline. And we thought this has two drawbacks. One, um, it sort of separates uh, students from sort of their curiosity, and it separates them directly from the research. Research is a noun, that's the thing that other people do that I'm here to learn about where really what we're trying to get them to understand is that research is a verb, research is a thing that you do, and to give them the skills to do it themselves. So we restructured the whole class around inquiry, by which I mean uh, each week we had a different question, not sort of a technical question, what is Beck's theory of depression, but sort of the sort of question you might have down the pub, how should I study, uh, do people see the same blue, uh, these sort of natural questions that people have, and then we throw all of psychology at them to try and answer it. So if we have a question like, um, uh, why do we see ghosts? We think of them as a perceptual illusion, we think of them as a memory effect, we think of them as a cultural artifact, and we try and answer all of these questions with all of the evidence that we can. What do we mean by evidence? Well, again, we try to go across psychology, uh, so we would get some artifacts from the Petri Museum to look at how ancient Egyptian people thought about the brain. Uh, we would look at uh, Francis Galton's racist uh, head spanners used to argue for differences between races. Uh, we would get a magician in and then we'd use eye tracking to see uh, how he does sleight of hand. Uh, we even managed to drag uh, Joe Devlin up in front of the students and we gave a, trans a cranial magnetic stimulation of his brain just so we could see him twitch. That's Joe for us. Uh, what I wanted to tell you about today is how we brought the research methods in through using Gorilla. Uh, and actually, I don't know if people know this, but Joe Evershed, the founder of Gorilla, uh, used to be an undergraduate in my class. And I think she started Gorilla really out of frustration of the inadequacies of my teaching and the research methods. Uh, so if, if you use Gorilla, you have my own inadequacies to thank for it existing in the first place. Uh, but now Joe and Nick have developed this tool. We try and use it right at the start of our undergraduate program to try and get students doing research themselves. And we do this through integrating their lectures, their labs, and their seminar series all tied together and structured. So for example, in the first term, uh, we teach them about the implicit uh, association test, a way to look at the associations between attitudes people have implicitly. And to begin with, we talked about the theory behind this when we're talking about attitudes and prejudice, and then we got people to complete the experiment online using Gorilla. So to begin with, they were subjects in this experiment. And in the study, you categorize good and bad words with buttons, and you categorize faces as black or white. And then the next lecture, we process their data, and we can say, look, this is your data right here. It seems that you are slower to pair good words and black faces, or um, bad words and white faces. This is your reaction time, this is your difference, you're all a bunch of racists. Well, that's how we begin the conversation. Then there's a more nuanced chat about what we mean by implicit and explicit racism, how this connects to behavior, but we show them their own guerrilla data as a way to start this conversation. And then this, this uh, discussion continues into their seminars uh, where they start to think about different interpretations of that result, what it really means, and also to think about, well, how could we broaden this out? We used a racial IAT there, but um, luckily our world is full of different types of prejudices, uh, and they try and think of their own ones that they could test in their experiments. Uh, just this morning, there was a report that Premier League uh, commentators in football matches are six times more likely to talk about black, uh, black players' speed and strength, and three times more likely to talk about white players' intelligence. So there's a hypothesis they could investigate. Is there an association between sports people of different race and these different qualities? So they thought through their own ideas. They were incredibly creative of the different types of prejudice they could test, and they developed their own experiments. 
Then they implemented these in Gorilla. And the first thing they had to think through, and this is a great practical exercise to think through these limitations, they had to things like, well, if I want to represent uh, speed or intelligence as a category on screen, uh, how do I operationalize that? Right? Not in a sort of abstract way, but here's Google image search. How do I get pictures that tap into that concept? And how do I avoid all of those cons confounds, right? Because if you have one or two prime strength, you know, have a person lifting weights, so that person will be of a particular race, so maybe that's a confound. So it was a great practical way to think through all of these problems that they might not encounter personally until their third year when they start to make their own experiments. So we had lots of really interesting conversation at this stage of how do you get that concept or that idea from society and put it into a stimulus. So they used Gorilla and they created their own experiment. Um, and it took about one half hour class with me, them showing them, uh, here's Gorilla, this is not the real speed I do it. Uh, here's the template for the IAT. Here's where you go in, here's where you, up, you upload your stimuli, and here's where you tweak it. So now it's your experiment. So it was all very structured for them. They just had one element to change, but they got very familiar with tweaking with the Gorilla system and seeing how they could make stuff. So they made their own experiments and then they uh, released them onto the world. They sent around to their friends and their families and so on. And the first year we did it, I was absolutely blown away. There was 26 different experiments in this group of about 150 students. And they collected almost 1,500 participants, uh, which is more data than I collected in my career up until that time. So they collect all the data on Gorilla. And again, these are first years. This is only like a few weeks uh, post A-level. Uh, so we do the data analysis for them at this point. We harvest all of their data. Then I have R scripts that just churn all through that and present them back. Here is your data. Here is what you found. They get a little packet of text analyses and a little packet of um, plots that I've drawn, but also the raw data too. So the more advanced ones can pick apart their data. They can look at correlations with individual differences. They can go a little bit deeper. And they found out remarkable things. We were quite uh, surprised by the variety of things that they looked at. So after we give them back this little uh, packet of data, what they do then is create a poster, uh, just like you would at a regular conference, a real physical conference, not one of these. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the ones from the first year. They had responses to people uh, with, with Down syndrome. They had, uh, do people think blonde people are really more stupid than non-blonde people? Uh, the answer is no, surprisingly. Uh, and they had, uh, do people have negative associations towards uh, the, the symbols of Islam as opposed to the symbols of uh, uh, Christianity? And there are other results like, uh, are pe do people find uh, people with tattoos threatening? And again, that was an interesting question because if you Google image search people with tattoos and not tattoos, you get particular types of people, which is a conference. So one group investigated this, did a wonderful job photoshopping tattoos in and out of different people so they could have a carefully balanced uh, stimulus design. So there's lots of creativity and lots of, sort of deep thought went into this. Of course, not all of the experiments worked. Some did, some didn't, uh, but we were able to discuss, well, why do you think that didn't work? Uh, this particular uh, one on um, Islam that you see in the bottom right there, uh, that found no result. There was no negative association uh, that people had towards the symbols of Islam. Uh, which I thought was interesting. And then we drilled down and we looked at their participant pool. Again, this is a lesson of doing stuff online. In your mind, you just think, well, they're going to run students, they're going to run local people. But those students shared it around their, fam uh, their, their family groups, their friendship groups, and half of the students were from um, Oman and, and Saudi Arabia. So half of our participants were from another side of the, of the world where there's a very different cultural setup. And we didn't even predict that we would be looking at worldwide data, but you have a worldwide student body, you have a tool that's online, and you get all this incredible data from across the world. So then we broke it down into countries where the religion, there were different dominant religions, and we found systematic patterns. So again, it was an unexpected uh, bonus of having this stuff online. You can collect data from a huge uh, spectrum of people, and it's really rich and interesting differences. So we can get out of this uh, weird bubble a little bit. So this is the IT project that they did in the first term. In the second term, they do a slightly different thing and we sort of expand what we ask the students to do. So in this project, uh, it's a very simple question. Uh, what determines if people give more or less to charity? And in the IET project, there was a big theoretical background of what we're doing and how we're trying to look at this stuff. But here what we gave them was a very simple template. Uh, here's how you measure charitable giving, just a slider in Gorilla, how much you would donate. And here's a structure where you can give two versions of an advert or a video or a pitch asking for money. And here they came up with a hypothesis about what would, what of, of those two versions, which would give more giving. 
uh, which would produce a high level of donation. And they got these hypotheses from across the lectures that they were taking in that second term. So they had social psychology and they thought about conformity and social identity and how that may make a difference. Uh, they had memory decision-making modules. So some of them thought about Kahneman, Traversky, uh, framing biases and cognitive heuristics that may make you more likely to support one or another. Or they had individual differences lectures. So they measured extroversion or introversion or empathy uh, to see if that predicted how you would donate or not. So here we just give them the bare bones of an experimental template and they bring the hypotheses to it. And again, the challenge to them is you take this grand idea from the lectures, but can you condense that down into two different stimuli that are well controlled and only have that difference that you're interested in? That was the experimental challenge here. And again, they produce some uh, really wonderful things. This is just a simple template that we gave them just with a randomizer. And we said, okay, generate one stimuli you think will have a low oh, donations, one with a high, and explain your theoretical reasons, justify them, and so on. And these are just a couple examples of those uh, posters that came up. Uh, so these are two of the best from, from that year. Uh, this one in the middle looked at people's uh, religious nature. So they me measured whether or not those people were religious or not, if they self-identified by it. And then they had an advert about a family that was escaping um, persecution in a country and had immigrated to, uh, to Europe and looking at how likely are you to, to uh, donate to that uh, charity that helps refugees. And it was a very nice study because all they tweaked was whether or not the family that were fleeing, were they escaping persecution because of their religion, or were they escaping persecution because they were not religious, because they're atheists and they're being persecuted. So it was exactly the same facts. You have a family fleeing from one country to another, uh, but it's because they are religious or specifically because they're not. And that was just a, a couple were differences. And what they found is people were uh, supporting these charities differently, depending on if they were personally religious or not. So if it was atheists deciding whether or not to uh, donate these charities, it didn't really matter. But if they were religious people, they are much more likely to help those people if they were uh, escaping religious persecution. So there's a really clever blend of individual differences and uh, social identity theory and how people empathize differently with different groups. The other post that I just put up as an example here uh, was looking at their charity was uh, to support victims of uh, domestic abuse. But I said victims, and that's the moot point. What they were interested in, uh, let me just show you, this is just sort of illustrates how well controlled these two stimuli are and how fine the differences were. So they had exactly the same uh, poster asking for donations, but the only thing they tweaked was whether or not it talked about someone being a survivor of domestic violence or a victim of domestic violence. And that difference had uh, almost a two to three fold increase in the donations. People are much more likely to support a survivor than a victim. Just one tiny uh, linguistic change there produced huge differences in donations. And the students were able to talk about the reasons this might be uh, and discuss a lot of theory connected with these ideas. So each time we've done this, what we've done is had the students vote and the faculty vote on the the best or the most uh, enjoyable posters from that term and we take those posters and we submit them to the BPS social psychology conference and each time we, we do this every single poster has been accepted and this year well actually last year because this year the whole thing is cancelled uh, but last year our students won the best poster competition and this was hugely gratifying uh, to us really because this is not a undergraduate conference this is not a teaching conference this is the proper bps psychology conference so we had our students stood there with their posters standing next to postdocs and faculty members and they were asking them you know you're grad school you're a postdoc and they're saying no i'm a first year student this is like month three of my entire uh career and there they were walking away with the poster prize so i'm a bit boastful about this because that's their achievement not mine uh but it was hugely gratifying and this is where we got comments they said well we felt like real scientists right they were actually contributing a little bit to this whole domain of knowledge not just passive observers so that's uh, our little experience with using these online tools the key things i think is to sort of gradually structure how students are using them uh, to begin with them as participants, they understand what it looks like, then to sort of have templates that gradually get looser and looser so they get more and more comfortable with playing with this by themselves. And of course, the other thing is, is the nice thing about Gorilla is we spent very little time talking about stimuli and how you constructed it. And we spent a lot of time talking about the psychological theory. How do you operationalize something? How do you visualize a particular concept? What's a control? So we spent a lot of these classes talking about the important stuff not the boring stuff of how you get a picture up or a GIF or a JPEG. Uh, that sort of dropped into the background, which is a very sort of heartening difference. 
But these are my collaborators on the project, Stephanie Lazaro, Jarina von Zimmern, Miles Taff, Katie Fisher, Alice McClellan, Anna Hughes. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Excellent, Daniel. Really great talk and, um, and, and very inspirational, actually. I mean, I, I love the fact that <laughs> these first year students are, are winning prizes at a conference and they feel like they're, they're scientists, which is exactly what, we, what we'd like to produce. At the, at the very end, you, you mentioned that you could get away from some of the boring implementational aspects um, and, and focus on more of the, the sort of the experimental design and stimulus design and things. I'm just wondering, because historically, the way we would normally have taught these uh, it, programming is to teach some kind of programming language, right? I mean, whether it's MATLAB or PsychoPy or something like that. One, does it matter that we're not teaching programming skills? So people like Max in his talk mentioned that he was doing the staircase procedure and of course you need to do programming even within, you know, Gorilla or something. And two, how do the students respond to that? I mean, do they like not having to do the programming or do we still have students who go on and do some as well? Uh, yeah, so that's a very good question. And I think our experience has been very positive, and this is a slightly mangled analogy, uh, but really we want to, to teach students to drive a car, to move around and to get places, right? And the traditional program approach is, okay, here's how a carburetor works, and here's how the combustion engine works. And they really, they just don't need to know that. You just want to get in the car and go somewhere. And that's what a system like this means. But of course you can get under the hood, right? You can do JavaScript program, you can do stuff, if you're that type of person, if you are a coder yourself, and some of our students are but many are not, they're just interested in these conceptual questions and the speed with which they can ask and get answers to those questions is much faster with this sort of system. Okay, fantastic. Well, I can see that Dorothy's slides are up. So I'd just again like to say thank you very much, Daniel, really enjoyed that.